God our Father, and from the Lord our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. The Gospel of St. John is going to serve as our sermon meditation this morning. We read from the 12th chapter, beginning at verse 20. Now there were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the festival. They came to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, with a request. Sir, they said, we would like to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip, in turn, told Jesus. Jesus replied, The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Anyone who loves their life will lose it, while anyone who hates their life in this world will keep it for eternal life. Whoever serves me must follow me, and where I am, my servant also will be. My Father will honor the one who serves me. Now my soul is troubled, and what shall I say, Father, save me from this hour? No, it was for this very reason I came to this hour. Father, glorify your name. Then a voice came from heaven, I have glorified it, and will glorify it again. The crowd that was there and heard it said it had thundered. Others said an angel had spoken to him. Jesus said, this voice was for your benefit, not mine. Now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world will be driven out. And I, when I am lifted up from the earth, will draw all people to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So far the word of our Lord. Please be seated. In the name of God's Son, Jesus Christ, dear Christian friends, in 2004, then-Senator Barack Obama was interviewed by a Christian news outlet, and the interviewer asked then-Senator Barack Obama, do you believe in sin? And he answered, yeah, I do believe in sin. And the interviewer said, well, how do you define sin? And he said this, he said, sin is being out of alignment with my values. You hear anything wrong with that answer? Sin is being out of alignment with my values. Well, what's the case with our values? Are our values ever in line with God's values? Do we have an inborn value system that's in line with God's value system? You can hear the slippery slope in that, can't you, definition? When you go to the first term of his presidency, he campaigned on marriage between one man and one woman. But when the pendulum in our country began to sway the other side and it was over 50% that then believed that same-sex marriage was a legitimate marriage, the value system changed when he was running against, I believe Mitt Romney, wasn't it, in his second term? Whoever he was running against. Then all of a sudden his value system changed and he said he's now for a marriage. If sin is being out of alignment with our own personal values, heaven help us all. Because then we get to define and interpret what sin really is. And that's never a safe thing, considering the fact that we're all born with a value system that is outside of the alignment of God's will, which is immutable and changeless and cannot be tampered with even though man tries to tamper with it. The Apostle Paul discovered this truth in his newfound faith of Christianity, that his inborn values were not in sync with the law of God. In fact, listen to how the Apostle Paul defines what sin is and what it isn't. In the seventh chapter of his letter to the church at Rome, Paul writes this. He says, look, I would not have known what sin was except through the law. He goes on and says, I would not have known what coveting really was if the law did not say, thou shalt not covet. Now, coveting is a word that seems to be going out of vogue in our society, the usage of it, but 
To put it simply, what coveting means is to have an unhealthy lust for something that you ought not have. Maybe something you cannot afford. Maybe something God doesn't want you to have. So that covers a whole gamut of things. It's the inborn desire of the human heart. Paul says, I wouldn't even know what this meant if the law did not say, thou shalt not do this. What's Paul acknowledging? Paul's acknowledging that my inborn values are not in sync with God's values. So I have to keep going back to what the law says for guidance as to what sin really is. Otherwise, the cultural norms are going to determine what my values ought to be or should be, or what, you know what I mean, what, what the most popular view of the day is. We call these perhaps cafeteria Christians who look at God's word as a smorgasbord. They pick and choose things that conform to their ideology and they conveniently dismiss things that are outside of the boundaries of their ideology. And then when confronted with what the word actually says, these people who dismiss those forms of the Bible, those teachings of the Bible that don't conform, then they relegate Holy Scripture to a resource instead of an authority. And when it's a resource, then they get to pick and choose. They get to become kings of their own castle, and they get to set up their own code of ethics and values. Now, dissecting Jesus into a person, into your own personal God, and believing what you choose to believe about God and his word, it's nothing new. This is not a 21st century discovery. This was going on in the time of Jesus. That's why Jesus oftentimes had to leave certain areas because they wanted something from him that he was not prepared to give them. And even the Apostle Paul, in his letter to the church at Corinth, he acknowledged, and yes, he stereotyped. He stereotyped the Jewish thought and he stereotyped the Greek thought by saying these words. He said, look, Jews demand miraculous signs. In other words, you better have a miraculous sign to accompany your authority because I'm not going to trust your word alone. Paul says this is how the Greeks behave. They look for wisdom. They want to find the next Confucius or Gandhi to come along that will bring them true enlightenment to their earthly life here in this life because they're more concerned about what's going on here than what's to come over there. And Paul says, we, however, preach Christ crucified, who's a stumbling block to the Jews, and simply foolishness to the Gentiles. Well, in our text today, Jesus' earthly life is winding down. He's in the temple grounds now, and he's being sought after by whom? None other than Greeks. We don't know too much about these Greeks. We know Paul classifies them as people who love wisdom and philosophy. So they come upon one of Jesus' disciples on the temple grounds by the name of Philip, and they say to Philip, Sir, we'd like to see Jesus. Now, they didn't want to see the outward form of what Jesus looked like or what Jesus was wearing that day. What they wanted was an interview with Jesus, which is closer in line with the word that's used in the original text. They wanted to investigate Jesus because, once again, the Greeks were thinking, Hey, this is the most polarized man in Palestine right now. People either hate him and want to see him dead, or they love him and hang on to every last word that he says. So they wanted their crack at him and see if he had any usefulness for them in their earthly life. Now you might notice in our text today that the interview never took place, did it? Jesus didn't even entertain an interview with these Greeks. But for the sake of our text today, if you had the opportunity to question Jesus, what would you ask him? What's really on your mind about God and the things of God? And just suppose for a moment you had a crack at an interview with Jesus, what question would you ask him? Maybe you'd ask him, Lord, why did you have to put that miserable tree in the middle of the garden? and allow sin and death to come in the world like it did. Or maybe your curious mind would get the best of you and you'd try to figure out, can you help us understand this eternity thing? So you tell us in your word that you never had a beginning, but that you were always there. How can you always be somewhere when everything else has a 
time period, a beginning and an end. Or maybe you would ask him a cultural question and say, you know, Lord, it does seem as though if two men are in love with each other, at least our cultural uh, norms say that that's acceptable, and heaven knows there's a lot of Christian churches today that accept that too, um, is that acceptable? Or maybe yours is one of uh, universal sort of uh, curiosity where you're like, you know, Lord, everyone worships God in some sort of form, right? You've got Allah, Buddha, and all these other false gods out there. Are they all acceptable ways to get to the same place? You know, the problem with an interview with Jesus often is that so often the questions that the church even has are explicitly answered for us in God's word. What's the problem there? You see, it's not just our inborn values that are out of alignment with God's will and God's word. It's our whole lives. Sometimes we treat the word of God and the study of that word like going to the dentist, don't we? It's like pulling teeth to get us to look and study the word of God and grow in our faith. Why? Because it's not just our inborn values that are out of line. There is a rebellious hostility inside of the human heart that resists God's word and says, you know what, I only want to know what I absolutely need to know, and the rest I reserve for being able to question in my life. It doesn't work that way. You'll notice in our text today that Jesus did not even entertain an interview with these Greeks. In fact, if you're just reading through our gospel lesson today, it might seem like sort of an odd text. You've got these Greeks who seriously want to see Jesus. We don't know why. We can only assume that Jesus knows why, because Jesus knows everything. They tell Andrew, or I'm sorry, Philip. Philip goes and finds Andrew. Philip and Andrew go, hey, Jesus, you're being summoned. But then what does Jesus do? He breaks out into why he's here. He's like, oh, the time has come. The time has come. And then he goes into the explanation of why he's here. And look at what he says. Very truly, I tell you, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. Now, Jesus, of course, is talking about himself there. And he's referring to his own death. That only through his death are other seeds of grain going to be produced. So he tells his disciples right here, right there, that without a crucified Christ, there is no rebirth into God's family. So we look at that wonderful sacrament that Christ instituted called water and the word, baptism. Interestingly enough, if you go to Romans chapter 6, the Bible tells us that when we were baptized, we were baptized into the death of Jesus Christ, which might sound a tad morbid at first, until you recognize that no death, no rebirth. And so that little child already born with the sinful stain of mom and dad is given a rebirth by being connected to the crucified Christ right in the waters of holy baptism where his sins are all washed away. That's how he's given the rebirth. Christ the crucified comes to that child. Moments from now there's another sacrament that Christ instituted called Holy Communion. You'll see bread, you'll taste wine, but Jesus asks you to believe what he promises in, with, and under that bread and wine are his flesh and blood. And he wants you and I to receive that flesh and blood because that's the flesh and blood of the crucified Christ. And only through a crucified Christ do you and I have what we need. And because our values are out of alignment with God, just like Barack Obama's, just like our current president, just like all of humanity, we all need that crucified Christ. And the good news is, we all have that crucified Christ. We have him by faith. We behold and apprehend the crucified Christ by faith. He's ours. The wash us of our sins which is why we gather in his house. Jesus once said to his followers in that upper room, greater love is no one than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. You know, Jesus does not dignify an interview with these Greeks, but he does go into an explanation of why he's here, he's come to die, his time has come, 
And he goes on and explains what this death all means for their life going forward. And he says to them, now is the time for judgment on this world. Well, I thought judgment wasn't until judgment day. Yeah, there's a judgment day called the end too. But at his death, there's another judgment day that Jesus is describing in our text today. He says, now is the time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world, which is the devil, will be driven out. But I, when I am lifted up from the earth will draw all men to myself. He said this to show the kind of death he was going to die. So his crucifixion is going to draw all people to himself. Now, when Jesus cried out at Calvary's cross, it is finished, he is declaring that judgment upon the world and upon the prince of this world. For what do we learn that Jesus did right after he died on that cross? We say it each week when we confess the Apostles' Creed that he descended into hell. What in the world was he doing there? Some people think that he was, was part of the process of suffering. No, no, he wasn't suffering when he descended into hell. He created hell. He created it for the devil and his angels. He descended to that which he created to proclaim his victory. That's what Jesus is talking about when he says, now is the time for judgment. Now is the time to drive out that prince of this world. You see, prior to the death of Jesus Christ, Satan had leverage over us with God. Satan could stand between you, me, and God and say, hey, these people have values more in line with my God than they do you. And could any of us deny that? No. But Jesus, as our substitute, has come to drive that devil out and cause him to release that stranglehold upon us. How did he do it? By bearing the sins of the whole world upon himself. He descends into hell to declare to Satan that you have now been driven out. Your power is rendered useless against God's people. And look what Jesus says through that holy cross that he dies upon. He will draw all people to himself. Think of those prophetic words of Jesus. He hadn't died yet. But here we are, 21st century, 2,000 years later, we are fulfilling prophetic words of the Lord Jesus Christ, because why are we drawn here today? But to celebrate our rebirth that came through the crucified Christ, which is ours by faith and our privilege to proclaim to others. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of God, which surpasses all human understanding, may it guard and keep your hearts and minds through faith in Jesus. Amen.